Hello everyone, my name's Adam and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at how you can make a high performance bed for your 3D printer using aluminium tool plate, a heater and a flexible surface. This is going to be especially useful for people that have maybe a surface that just doesn't bond to materials very well or uneven heating so you get parts of the bed that you can't even use or warped beds and other things like that. This will give you a permanent solution to fix those issues. I've done this myself a few times now, so today I'm going to give you my tips on how I do it. First off, you need to measure up your old bed. So you need dimensions for the main plate, for the heater and for the surface. When getting your dimensions for the surface, so the magnetic, spring steel and print surface, you want something that's a little larger than the print area that you're trying to achieve. So if you're trying to get a 300 by 300 millimeter build area, aim for a 310 by 310 surface. This isn't absolutely necessary, but does help in terms of tolerances and making sure you achieve your goal. While we used CAD for creating the Hamira adapter, in this case, it's not something you really need to do. It's quite simple and it's all basically two dimensional geometry. So what you can do CAD, and if you have it all in CAD already, that's not going to be a problem. But for me, I find it just as easy to do this on a two dimensional piece of paper and just draw out the dimensions that I want. Once you've got the dimensions sorted, it's now time to move on and look at the individual parts themselves. So first off, we're gonna take a look at the bed plate. For this, you're looking for a material that is rigid, flat, conductive, and as lightweight as you can make it. Of course you need it to be rigid. If your bed wobbles as the printer moves, then that's really not gonna help you get any consistency in your prints at all. So rigidity, obviously, very key. Secondly, of course, you want it to be very flat. Getting good first layer adhesion is essential to a successful print, especially when it's very large and takes very long. So you want your bed to be as flat as possible to get the best possible adhesion to it. Thirdly, thermal conductivity is gonna be essential for ensuring even heating across all of the heated bed. Materials with low thermal conductivity will just end up with warm and cold patches, so you want to avoid those if you can. And lastly, weight. Weight is very important on a bed that moves backwards and forwards, so a sled style bed. For beds that move up and down, it's not so essential, but it will still drive other parameters of the printer. If, like me, on the Formbot, you do have this sled style printer, the more weight you have, the lower your acceleration will need to be. So that will affect your print times, of course, but don't worry too much, it will still be like fine. So the material that I choose to use is aluminium tool plate. Aluminium is a fairly rigid material, it's very conductive, tool plate is extremely flat, and being aluminium rather than maybe steel or copper is fairly lightweight. The thicknesses that I tend to go for are around five or six millimeters, but anything more than maybe a 500 by 500 bed, you really ought to look at something thicker in order to retain as much rigidity as you can. What I'm going to go with for the Formba upgrade is this five millimeter, 5,000 series aluminium. And of course, it's tool plate. Next, of course, you need the magnetic surface. The magnetic surface will allow you to have a flexible sheet on top, which you can remove in order to make removal of the print much easier. In my mind, this is one of the most essential parts of a 3D printer nowadays, and it's a feature that I can't live without. What's critical when buying a magnetic sheet is the operating temperature, mostly. 
if you're looking to operate your bed at up to maybe 110 degrees Celsius, you need to identify a magnetic sheet that has a safe or consistent or max operating temperature that is a little bit above that, maybe 10 or 15 degrees in order to give you a bit of leeway in terms of temperatures. An alternative to magnetic sheet is to use embedded magnets. This can be a fairly complex milling operation to mill basically a small slot into the back of the aluminium, leaving a very thin amount of material between that and the surface, and then you can embed or glue a magnet into that space. This process, while it can be quite good, is quite effective, is what's used on the Prusa machines, although they don't have an aluminium bed. It can be quite inaccessible for most home users, which is why I generally choose to go with a magnetic sheet that you can just basically stick onto the top. It's very, very easy. One tip when applying it is to make sure that you clean down the aluminium surface or whatever surface you choose to use before trying to apply the magnetic sheet. Aluminium tool plate in particular looks very, very clean and shiny. In fact, so much that it's really difficult to film, but it is still dead. <coughs> there are still machining uh, waste on it. So make sure you wipe it down to make sure you get a good adhesion of the magnet to the print, to the bed. Yes, definitely do that. The next thing is the flexible plate itself. This is gonna be the actual part of the printer that we're removing in order to bend it and get the printer off. The predominant material you want to be looking for here is spring steel. The reason being, spring steel has a very high tensile strength. Yeah, you might not know what that means, but it basically means that you can bend it a lot without it permanently deforming. So you can put a big bend in it and you let go and it'll come back to its original position. Spring steel, is obviously a type of steel which is not very thermally conductive but we don't worry about that too much because a we have the aluminium sheet which is going to be distributing a lot of that heat evenly across the bed anyway and secondly it is really quite thin the reason it's still flexible is because it's very thin so not too much to worry about there in terms of thermal conductivity next we have the print surface personally i would encourage using what works for you if you know that there's a surface that you use maybe quite a lot and it works for the type of applications that you're looking for, I would probably encourage sticking with that. Just because it's there's nothing worse than going to a new surface on a new printer with a new setup and then going, oh, that doesn't work quite how I hoped it would. My favorite surfaces to use recently have been textured PEI and smooth PEI. So PEI of many forms is fairly useful for me. And that's what's typically found on the Prusa machines. The surface that I've got here is PEX, which is seems to be a kind of evolutionary material from PEI that's uh, been made by Wham Bam Systems. So that's specifically for 3D printing. So hopefully I'm expecting similar and slightly better performance to what I can expect with PEI. 
For the magnetic sheet, spring steel, and the print surface, you can get all of these from Wham Bam Systems, and they do ship globally. So go ahead over there and take a look. Thank you very much to them for providing the kit that I'm using to upgrade my FormBot. The last thing we need to look at is of course the heater. Of course, if you don't have a heater, it's just a bed and not a heated bed. So it's absolutely fundamental if you want to print anything but very basic PLA. So the typical kind of heater that we're looking at for a 3D printer in this application is what we call a silicone pad heater, which is basically a soft, flexible heater, which you stick to the underside of your bed, plug it in and it heats it up. These, co these typically come with an integrated thermistor as well, so make sure that if you are specifying the thermistor that you specify the right one because it's not very easy to change. While they do look flexible, soft and uniform all the way across their surface, you can't cut them. I don't mean like it's impossible to put scissors through them. What I mean is if you do, it will break the bed and it will be unusable. So make sure that the geometry that you buy is suitable for the bed exactly as it is. If you have to make modifications, well, you can't make modifications. Hopefully that's really clear because you can't cut it. There's traces inside all that stuff which causes the heating. If you cut part of the bed, you cut the traces and then it doesn't heat anymore. So yes, don't do that. The main thing to specify when getting a silicon pad heater is the power output. So how much power is it going to generate in heat, which is going to obviously go up into the bed. The correct answer here is approximately five kilowatts per meter squared. If you understand how those units work and you're designing a 3D printer, then there you go, that's the number you need. For anyone else, here's a basic calculation that you can use in order to just very systematically estimate what the correct bed power should be for your specific printer. To do the calculation, you very simply take the number five, multiply it by your X dimension, multiply it by the Y dimension. Both of those need to be in millimeters, not inches or anything else. And then divide that by a thousand. So that number that you then get from that calculation is the bed power approximately in watts. If you need to check that the calculator you made was right, maybe you put those things into Excel, you can check with a 200 by 200 bed because that should be 200 watts. So there you go. You can validate that what you're calculating is right by that, change the numbers to whatever your bed size is that you need or would like, and you can work out what an approximate sensible power would be. So why is that specific power useful. Why is that important? Why can't you just increase double the power, double the heating, faster heat times, everyone's a winner, right? Well, unfortunately, it's not really that simple. While it would heat up the bed quicker, you do run into other issues. As we mentioned earlier, aluminium tool plate is very flat and it's important to have a flat bed and to keep it flat over time. If you have a very high power heater, it will heat one surface very, very quickly. So, if you imagine maybe your aluminium is six millimeters thick and you put like a 10,000 watt heater or something ridiculous on the bottom of it, that very bottom surface when that heater turns on is gonna get very hot very quickly while the top is still cold. The problem with that is that as materials heat up, they also expand. So your very hot material right at the base of that bed is gonna be much hotter and therefore expand much more. Whereas the top surface is gonna be cold and retain the current expansion which is at. The problem with that expansion is that it will bend the bed. 
very easily. So if you have a high power heater, it will cause a large temperature differential, which means very hot at the bottom, very cold at the top, and that in turn will cause it to flex and bend in ways that you do not want. And it can permanently bend that pin bread. So avoid really high power heaters. They are not useful for 3D printers. In terms of wiring up the bed safely with correct wire gauges and connectors and drag chains and everything like that, we're going to cover that in a separate video. For now, we're just focusing on the bed. So don't forget to subscribe if you're interested in creating beds like this and how to create a safe printer that you can use for a long time. So that's it for heaters. But of course, there are some really good tips that I've got just to help you along the way if this is something you want to do as well. Firstly, standard parts are nearly always cheaper than buying custom made. The reason being, when something's standard, a company is typically making maybe tens, hundreds, or thousands of them, which means they get very good efficiency in the process, and it means they can reduce the cost significantly. However, if you're only making one of something, all the setup times, production times, shipping times, is all just for that one item. So there's loads of cost piled into producing that one thing, making it very, very expensive. The second and last tip is that these adhesive layers are one-shot attempt because they are very strong adhesives and they can withstand the temperatures that of course you're going to be printing and heating at, you really don't have any opportunity for wiggling it around or moving it. So when you do do it, A, make sure the surface is clean. B, make sure you're being very careful and methodical about how you're applying it. Make sure you're double checking that it fits and which way round it's supposed to go before removing any of the adhesive backing. And of course, give yourself plenty of time to do it. Don't try and rush it and make it a 10 minute job. Give yourself loads of time to be able to do it so you can re really make sure that you're thinking about it and just doing it slowly and make sure you get it right. So that's going to be it from me today. Hopefully this has been really useful for anyone looking to produce a custom high performance heated bed for your 3D printer. And of course we've gone through tool plates, flexible sheets, magnets, heaters and everything. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Yeah.